Welcome to Radical City Church. I am excited to be here today. I'm excited for what God is going to do and what he's going to say. Uh, one moment, why don't you turn with me in your Bibles real quick to Luke the 8th chapter, Luke the 8th chapter, Luke, Luke the 8th chapter, 8th chapter, Luke the Luke the 8th chapter. Um, I'm going to start at the four. Uh, the 45th verse, the 45th verse, uh, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would be with us in this time, that you would uh, speak to us through your heart or from your heart. I pray, God, that you would love on us in a special way, that you would teach us today um, in a manner that we would leave this place, not your presence, in an effort to be better for you to do more for you, to love more for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. And so today we start our brand new church series, and it is Church in the Wild. Somebody say Church in the Wild. Somebody say Church, Church, Church in the Wild. I want to go where the wild things are, uh, where the wild things are, where the, the people and the places that that the enemy doesn't want us in. And so um, I told y'all last week as we ended the Summer Jam series that my intention was to continue Summer Jams for the rest of the year. But with everything happening in and around us in our city, uh, the murders, the deaths, the uh, abuse, um, uh, et cetera, I felt a, a strong compulsion by Holy Spirit to change gears uh, because we needed to be motivated to go into the wild. Amen. So will you go into the into the thick of it, into the thick of it with me <laughs> over the next couple of weeks as we journey to make this happen? However it is, just go ahead and leave it. Um, as we journey to make this thing happen uh, for the future, for our city and for our neighbors and for our community. Amen. Amen. So Luke, the eighth chapter, Luke, the eighth chapter, I want to start at the 45th verse. And here's what he says. He says, and Jesus said, who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, master, the crowd surrounds you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, mm -mm. someone touched me. For I have perceived that power has gone out of me. Let's go back to 45. He says, and Jesus said, who was it that touched me? Who touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, someone touched me. For I perceived that power has gone out of me. May the Lord add a blessing to an already blessed word. You may be seated. You're making me nervous. You may be you're making me nervous. Church, church in the wild, church in the wild, church in the wild. Now, before we get to um, church in the wild, I want to start, and we'll deal with this more as when we jump into our back to school uh, series coming up in September. Just to set that up a little bit, listen, it's going to be crazy. We're going back to the basics. I'm going to teach you how to read the Bible, how to pray, how to have devotions, how to walk in the faith, what it means to be the church, what it means to be saved, what sin is actually about. But here's what's even doper about it. I'm going to jump up here on that Sunday morning you know I'm crazy I do crazy things I'm gonna have a letterman's jacket on or a letterman sweater because we all going back to school in September not just the students the church is going back to school in September we're gonna have pledge prep pledge processes for different areas of ministry. If you want to be in production, we're going to have a pledge process and you're going and you're going you're going uh you're going to pledge production for production. If you want to do ush, ush, ushering, if you want to do dance ministry, if you want to be in the musicians, all of these sections are going to be pledged and at the end we're going to celebrate y'all. We're going to do something crazy. We're going to have a huge party. We're going to have a graduation. I'm telling you it's going to be dumb, okay? It's going to be dumb, so I'm excited about our back to school, uh, our back to school series. Uh, but I want to talk about church in the wild, and again, I'll get to this more when we get to back to school or back to the basics. But the church, the church, the church, Greek word ekklesia, means called out ones, called out ones. In other words, these this is a section of people who are called out from the comfortable, the normal, uh, the I don't want to say regular, but for the purposes of this message, the regular are uh, to be different, to follow a different set of laws, to live a different type of way. In other words, the ecclesia doesn't look like everybody else. When people would see the ecclesia, they were like, oh, that's the church. In fact, 
uh, we got the word Christians because we were set out or set apart from everybody else. It wasn't a term of endearment. It was a term of uh, derogatory manner that suggested that these are the people who followed that Christ that Christ guy that we murdered. These are the guys, these are the people who have been causing uproar. So Christians in the early church uh, in biblical times, or the word Christian being used at Antioch, was not this symbol of beauty, but this symbol of rebellion. Uh, this symbol of rebellion. And so if, as we talk about church in a while, I want you to understand that the church is called out. Somebody say, we are called out. We are called out. We are called out to be different. We are called out to stand out. We are called out to heal. We are called out to hear. We are called out to feel. We are called out to love. We are called out to care. And so today I want to talk to you about a church in the wild that feels. A church that feels. A church that feels. Somebody say a church that feels. Here we are. Here we are in uh, Luke the 8th chapter. Jesus is walking through a crowd and I want you to, um, I want you to go back to the original church in the wild, uh, church in the wild slide. Um, you see all of the people in the background. I want you to imagine Times Square on a busy work day. Um, Jesus is walking through a crowd full of people. Okay, full of people. Um, uh, uh, Lamont and all the guys, come here for me. Lamont, all every fella in the building, come here for me. Come here for me. This is your opportunity to be famous. Uh oh, don't don't don't. Don't mess up your opportunity. Amen. <laughs> Don't mess up your opportunity. So I want everybody to get shoulder to shoulder, like shoulder to shoulder, to shoulder to shoulder, shoulder to shoulder. But in a crowd, like you're about to walk somewhere, like so you didn't got to be in a line, like just, you know, make it. Now here it is. Jesus is walking through the crowd. Just walk, just keep walking forward a little bit. Just walking, just walking, just turn, 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 just keep walking. And Jesus is walking through the crowd, and people are brushing, turn around, turn around, walking in a circle, walking in a circle. Thank you. He's just walking around, he's walking around, and he's touching people along the way. And out of nowhere, Jesus says, Hey, somebody touched me. While people are still walking, just keep walking, walk however you walk. And they're going wherever they want to go. Some are going to the market, some are going to the store, some are going to get some new kicks. I mean, whatever it it is that they're doing they're walking around and Jesus is obviously brushing people as they walk around and he says who touched me Peter says Jesus what are you talking about I don't understand what you mean what come on come on keep walking keep walking keep walking we get some exercise today um, <laughs> and so he keeps walking and as he's walking he keeps touching people he's saying who 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 touched me who who touched me Peter's like hey Jesus you tripping dog there's a lot of people out here everybody has touched you everybody has brushed past you there's too many people out here for you to really tell who touched you I mean everybody touched you go ahead and chill out for a second thank y'all uh, uh, he says go ahead and chill out for a second I just wanted to give you a small scenario of what happens he says go uh, uh, chill out for a second Peter I'm putting that in there it's not in the scripture but I'm just saying Peter's like yo Jesus you tripping a little bit and here it is he says no so somebody touched me because I perceive that 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 something has left me. I perceive that virtue or power has left my body. Today I want to talk to you about a church that feels because here's the truth of the matter: we're not feeling enough. We're, we're not feeling enough. Here it is. Jesus just doesn't feel. He recognizes the difference between somebody who touched him, who needed him. And the people who were in, uh, enamored by his celebrity, people who was enamored by his influence, people who were walking to see what he would do next. Jesus is, the, is in the middle. He had just done a couple of miracles. So everybody is fascinated by what Jesus is doing. Uh, and so they're following him all over the place, and everybody is touching him. Everybody is talking him. Jesus, can I get an autograph? Jesus, can I touch your hand? Jesus, can I shake your hand? Dap me up. You're the man. All of these good things. But Jesus is keep walking, is, is, is walking and walking and walking and says yo somebody touched me and that touch was a little bit different than everybody else's touch here I want to talk about a church that feels because here's what we really see there is we see not just discernment but we see a person who was so filled with uh, a relationship with God that was so filled with connection with God, not just barely, barely man and barely, barely God because let me let me break this down for you for a second Jesus is both human and God but when he walks on earth, he is God in flesh, meaning that he operates or he's operating according to the flesh. 
not according to the flesh in sin, but according to how man would navigate. In other words, he worked with his hands. He was a, he was a carpenter's son, so we could assume that he was a carpenter because in those days, you followed after your father. And so he worked with his hands. He ate with his mouth. It's not like Jesus went along and didn't eat regular food and drink regular drink. He lived like we lived. And this is, this is hugely important because at this time, Jesus is showing us what it means to be in amongst the people, but not in the people and feel what's going on with them at the same time. Jesus walking, Jesus walking the epitome of the church, the reason that the church exists, the reason that we are in the earth today. Jesus is walking and, and perceives that somebody has touched him. There's a reason why I'm not going into who touched him uh, necessarily today. We'll talk about that next week because we're going to talk about a church that heals. But I want to deal with just the church that feels, right? The church that feels is very aware of its surroundings. A church that feels is very aware of its surroundings. A church that feels is moved by the sirens that they hear every night. A church that feels is moved to prayer by the gunshots that they hear. They're not just ignoring them and ducking on the floor. They're going to their knees and praying that God, on the other side of that siren, I pray that there isn't a dead body. On the other side of that bo uh, of the ambulance uh, ring, I pray that somebody isn't having a heart attack. On the other side of those gunshots, I pray they miss whatever target they were because a church that feels is cognizant of its environment. A church that feels is very aware of the people who are touching them. Or are we a church that's so distant from today's issues and today's problems that we don't feel anything? Or are we a church that's so distant from today's problems or so consumed with our issues and our problems that we don't have time to feel anything else? Or are we a church that's so weak that when somebody reaches to touch us, nothing happens or changes in their life? The church isn't just a building. It isn't a building at all, in fact. It is the people who gather together in a building. It becomes the church when the church inhabits the building. Right? And so when I say church, I am talking about the individual church in the room as well as the communal collective church. So collectively, we are communal and we gather as the church. Individually, we walk in life as the church. This is why when one of us fail, the entire church gets the dark. This is why when one pastor falls, who is human, who can fall, when one pastor falls, the entire church catches the brunt of it. Because here's the deal, while we are individuals, we live collectively and we represent the entirety of the called out ones. And so if you aren't feeling as the church, if you can't perceive that there are needs around you as the church, then the entire church as a whole has to carry that bag. And we have to step up to a place where the church is in the wild on purpose. A church that feels a church that's in the wild on purpose. Are you with me so far? A church that feels is not afraid to engage the crowd. It's not afraid to engage the crowd. I remember a couple of my of our team when we first started in the hood. The first question one of them would ask is, are we going at night? <laughs> if we were going to Prentice Park, the question is, um, 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 Pastor Lou, uh, is security going to be with us? Now, it's a valid question because of the type of neighborhood we're going in. It's a valid question. I live on Randolph Street, and on Randolph Street is Prostitution Alley. Uh, there we can see heroin addicts leaning. In fact, we will have block parties in our yard, and there will be people leaning from a heroin lean with a hot dog plate and a soda in their hand. I don't understand how it didn't spill, but it doesn't spill. Uh, they have a, uh, 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 They have this. We have this, this need to, to engage the crowd, engage the community because we are connected enough or we want to be connected enough to God in prayer that when people are hurting, we can feel them. We can, we can feel them that the person on the side of the street, that the person on the side of the street uh, isn't necessarily just asking for a dollar. They're 
asking for time. That they're not just asking for a meal. They're asking for somebody to pay attention to their need. And here's the deal. I'm so worried about being late to work, which I'm already going to be late for, <laughs> that I don't have the time to engage enough with the per person who touched me with their infirmity, who touched me with their need, to engage with them enough to make something happen for their life. A church that feels is a church that engages the crowd. A church that feels is a church that is sensitive to its environment. The purpose of Jesus in the earth was to meet the needs of the broken. It was not just to be the atoning lamb, sacrificial lamb, for the sins of the world. Yes, ultimately, that was the purpose. But while he lived here, his purpose was to be an example for us of how the church should live and dwell amongst people. I remember a time in scripture where Jesus is walking through the crowd, etc., and there's a lot of people who are qualified to have, to have dinner with Jesus. There's a lot of people who, quote, unquote, should be having dinner with Jesus. There are a lot of dignitaries and such who should be doing uh, with Jesus what others would do. And I remember the scripture says that Jesus looks up in a tree, and he looks up in a tree, and Zacchaeus is there. And he says, Zacchaeus, you come down and eat with me. Now, what in the world? Why would Jesus uh, call Zacchaeus down uh, to eat with him? He perceived that Zacchaeus had a need that everybody else didn't have. Again, here it is. You want something from me. Zacchaeus needed something from me. The people around you need something from you. They're not just there working with you day to day. They're not just in the gym working out with you. They're not just at your job. They're not just at your school. They're not just in your community. You're not just hanging out with them. They are there because there is something that they need from you. Problem is you don't have enough prayer life. We don't have enough time with God. We're not in our word enough. We, we aren't being the called out ones ourselves. So here's the truth of the matter. I can't perceive the need because if somebody looked at me and you together, they would think that we both have the same need. You're drinking with me. You're eating with me. You're sitting with me. You're, you're, watching, you're watching other women with me. You're doing all of these other things. You lusting after men with me. You're doing all of these other things. And so here's the truth. The person that needs you can't get anything from you because you look like them. When we get to, the, to, the, to another piece of this series called A Church That Rebels, I'll talk about the gray area that we live in. The gray area that we live in where we look so much like the world and nobody can tell that we're the church. Here's the question. If people saw us in a crowd, would they say there's a Christian or would we look like everybody else? And I'm not talking about how we dress or how we carry ourselves as it relates to the stylistic part of life. I'm talking about the heart that's perceived when we walk in a room. A church that feels changes environments and atmospheres. Jesus is walking through the crowd. A woman reaches forth and touches them. She touches him. And he feels somebody touched him, and he asked, here's the thing, he asked some people who should have been cognizant of their environment, who should have been paying attention to what's going on, who should have been watching the surroundings, who should have heard the cries of the people who really needed Jesus. And Jesus says, who touched me? I would eisegetically suggest that Jesus asked, who touched me? Not just for the woman to come forward and say, who touched me? But to see if Peter and them were paying attention to the people that he would leave them with. It's sad to say that Jesus is left in our care. People who we don't recognize people in situations that we don't feel, people who are in close proximity to us that we don't care for. We'll care more for the stranger than we will for the people who are intimately in our lives. We'll care more for the neighborhood that we live in uh, or, the, or the homeless person on the street uh, because we're tired of telling our brother, our sister, our cousin, our uncle, our mother that Jesus lives and that Jesus saves. So because I'm tired of it and you're not listening, I'm going to just stop doing it. Now, I'm not going to stop until you leave me. I'm not going to stop telling you how good he is until you, until you block me, right? Because here's the truth of the matter. is more than your attitude. I care about your soul. 
More than how mad you're going to be about me, I care that you're going to hell if you don't change. More than anything that you can do to me, like block me on social media, I'm going to share with you the truth of uh, uh, that Christ is alive and that he loves you and that he wants to bring you into right relationship with God because here's the truth of the matter. I, you need the church. We need the church. The church is not expendable. It's not expendable. I'm going to tell you the truth. Virtual was temporary, even though we'll never go back fully in person. We'll always be virtual. Virtual got us through the pandemic. It won't get you through the rest of life. You know why? Because virtual, uh, virtual is absent of community. God created us to be in community with each other. You don't believe me? Let's go to Genesis. In the beginning, he creates man and woman, man, and then he says it's not good for what? For man to be alone. Why isn't it good for man to be alone? Because we all need community. He goes fast forward. He goes and he picks 12 disciples. And he picks 12 disciples not just to walk with him because Jesus is lonely. He's God. Right? Not because Jesus is by himself and he's afraid. No. Because he knows, one, that he needs community in the, in the flesh. He also knows that when he leaves, somebody has to spark a movement that will create a continuation of community called the church. He takes them around with them so they can look and pay attention to him on how to feel the environment. How to feel the needs of the people around you. Listen, I say this to uh, my wife often, and here's the truth of the matter. When you're close to someone and you really love them and you really pray for them, you absolutely feel them. And so when they say they don't have an attitude, ladies, <clears throat> I just say sometimes to her, it's not true. I can feel you. Right? It's not just because I love her. It's because she's my one. Right. We are one. So when we are one, I should feel you. Right. If you're hurting, I should feel that. And here's the truth. The, the God has made the church so supernaturally necessary that we should feel in the spirit when people need us, just like we should feel our spouses when we need when when they need us. And when we've offended or bothered them or they have or they feel in some type of way. People who are around us. In the streets who are lost are feeling some type of way. And because we are in our own little bubble, because we are lee -de -dee -dee -dee, because we are walking around worried about our needs and worried about our perceived uh, uh, necessities in life, we are missing the opportunity to feel the, the iniquities and the infirmities of the people around us. Here's the truth of the matter is we aren't even able to intercede for people because I don't even feel you. I don't even feel that you have a need for intercession. And so I'm not praying for me. I'm not praying for my wife. I'm not praying for you. I'm just not praying at all. And so ineffective, I'm in, I, effectively, I'm ineffective as the church. I'm ineffective at doing what it is that the Lord has called me to be, the ecclesia, the called out ones, the called, the called out ones, the called out ones. People don't even come to the church for help anymore because they perceive that they won't get it. They, they, they perceive that the church won't, won't be there. Some, some, of, some, some, of, some of them will, will take one bad experience and put the whole experience, some of us rather, not some of them, some of us, will take one bad experience with one person in the church and, and say that the entire church is trash, right? Uh, and here's the truth of the matter. Most of that is our fault. It's not just the pastor in the pulpit who is responsible to feel what's going on in the crowd. It is also the responsibility of the brothers and sisters in the crowd to feel what's going on around them, right? It is a collective responsibility to love on care for and be uh, the church to people who need to feel the presence of the church. It was disappointing to be the only one, uh, one of the only churches that, that is out there when the young man Logan loses his life in the London Oaks fire. It was even more, what have you, uh, disappointing to see that the aid was coming from places other than the church. It was beautiful to see that the community 
without the church was being the community because there is a duty for those who aren't in Christ to also love on the people that are around them. It is humanity's uh, responsibility to love and care for humanity. More of a responsibility for the church to care for and love on humanity. But it's disappointing to see that the church isn't in the wild. So what do we do to be in the wild? What do we do to feel? We have to come out of our spaces of comfort and step into discomfort. A church that feels is often uncomfortable. A church that feels is often uncomfortable because uh, we end up or we find ourselves in places that can be dangerous. We find ourselves in places that can be scary. We find ourselves in places where we can be rejected. We find ourselves in places where people will rebel against us. We find ourselves in places where people won't like us, love us, or care for us. We find ourselves in places where we will pour ourselves into people who will reject us. It's, it's an uncomfortable space. But it's a called out space. Either you want to be special or normal. Either you want to be a Christian or not. Either you want to be the church or not. Big Daddy Kane said, ain't no half stepping. Right? There's no way that we can be one foot in and one foot out and effectively change the earth. Here is the truth. It's getting bad. It's not getting better. And an absent church will only perpetuate what's happening in the earth. Apathy, uh, apathy or silence is complicity. It means that we are participating in the fall of the world. The more I'm silent, the more I don't feel, the more I don't care, the more I don't love, I am complicit in the fall of those who are not in the church. Am I saying that the church is perfect? No. Am I saying that the church is the end all be all? Yes. We are and should be the space that people run to for love, for care, for resources. We are the space that people should come to uh, if they need rent paid, light bills paid, and prayer. Right? We should be the space uh, that people run to who need food and clothing and shelter. We should be the space where battered women can come to and say, hey, my husband is beating me up and they don't have any room in the shelter. We should be a space that is a city within a city where people can find their needs met because the church feels. The church feels. The church is there. The church is cognizant of it. And so the vision should be should be. Uh, um, are relative to filling the people in the environment, right? If we had a city who felt its environment, we'd have more recreation centers. If we were in a city who could feel what's going on, we would have, uh, by any means necessary, more cops and police on the street. If we had a city that feels we would be in our community, in the city, as we say, for the city, if we had a city that feels. But since we don't, we need to be a church that does. We need to be a church that is present, a church that feels to engage with our, our world in a world or a, word, a worldwide web of nothingness, a worldwide web of selfishness, of success, of pursuits, of companionship, everything that we deem on our list, everything on our list we deem more important than feeling the people around us, than loving on the people around us, and then we call ourselves the church. And then we call ourselves Christian then we call ourselves God's children. I used to get bothered when I would hear somebody saying, you calling yourself a Christian. But people have a perception of what we should be. Now, here's the truth of the matter. Some of it is broken. Some of, some of what people think we should be is broken because what people think we should be is perfect. And the truth of the matter is, I said it earlier, the church is not perfect. We will not be perfect because we're full of imperfect people. We are people who are in need of a savior 
and thank God that we have a Savior and Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us because the imperfect that you see would be so much worse <laughs> if I didn't have Jesus, if I didn't have community, if I didn't have Holy Spirit. And so the church is, I'm not suggesting that the church is perfect. I'm suggesting that the church is here and the church should be here and the church should feel. The church should feel what's going on around us. But filling ourselves, we find ourselves oblivious to the surrounding people. The last problem with the church, that uh, the last, the, the solution to a church that feels, the solution to a church that feels is being a church that's present. It's being a church that's present. I remember early in my marriage, one of the things that my wife would have an issue with me about, here's the deal, here's the deal. we are transparent people. Right, we live transparently because I believe that transparency heals. Right, and so I remember it early in my marriage, um, I would come in the house always on the phone. I would come in the house and I would get on my computer immediately, and I would use as an excuse or a reason um, that this is how we pay the bills. I am I am working. I am taking care of the things necessary um, so that we can have the things that we have. Um, this is important, ain't it? Like let me. And she would fall back. She would fall back. She would fall back. But it was a bother. It was a bother to her and eventually <clears throat> and eventually she said one day I said I'm here I'm right here uh, we're trying to watch a movie and I'm on my computer making a fly or creating vision or writing some business plan doing something else um, and we're I'm here I'm, I'm watching the movie yeah baby that was good that was funny and she said to me one day she said yeah you're here but you're not present you're here but you're not present so here's the truth the church can be in a physical location it could be visible to the street. It could be visible to the neighborhood, but not present in the city, not present in the people, not present in the neighborhood, not present in the community. Thusly, not only does the church not feel, but the people doesn't feel the, don't feel the church. Here's a question that I ask myself that my pastor often asks us. Um, uh, he says, Dr. Vernon says very simply this question. He says, if your church closed tomorrow, would the city miss you? If your church closed tomorrow, would the city miss you? That is a conviction that stays with me. Um, one, I don't want to close. Two, I don't want to close and, and have been here spinning my wheels and they don't miss us. I'll ask you this question. If you moved from your neighborhood, would your neighbors miss you? If you left your job outside of what you do for them, right, would the people around you miss your presence? When you leave your school, you graduate uh, from high school and you go on in life, will your high school friends miss you? Will you have made such an impact in your, in your community uh, by filling the needs of them? Here's the deal. We make impact not just, uh, not just by being there, but by being present. And being present means that I feel when you touch me. I feel when you reach out to me. There are people touching you. Uh, they're touching you just by the way they look at you. They are touching you by the certain things that they say. Well, yeah, everything is, you know, it's cool, I guess. I guess they just touched you, right? They're reaching out for you to reach in to help do what we'll do next. Talk about next week as a church that heals. But we got to start by feeling. We got to start by being present. Everybody standing. We got to start by being present. We got to start by finding crowds to be in. Finding the people and neighborhoods to engage in. Being more than just an employee, but Jesus where you are. Being more than just a nurse or a doctor, a lawyer or a teacher, but being Jesus or the church where you are. A church that feels people is present. And so here's what we're going to do, and this is the challenge to everybody in this church. This Thursday, um, this Thursday, around 5.30, um, 6 o'clock, 5.30-ish, we're going to go to a neighborhood in the city, and we're just going to be present. We're just going to pass out fro free freeze pops to the kids in the neighborhood. That's just free freeze pops. Well, yeah, they don't have any. <laughs> right? We're going to take a football or a basketball out there 
and, and, and engage in their type of fun, which is curveball, where you throw a ball from one side of the curve to the other side of the curve um, and hope that it hits the curve so you, hits the curve so you, can, you can get the point. Right? We're going to go out and we're going to pass out freeze pops and we're going to engage with the young people and hopefully uh, their parents will come out and they'll have conversations with us. We're not there to save the world. We're there to be the church. And so Church in the Wild is present, and so I would, I would engage you and implore you to be present with us this Thursday as we go into this neighborhood, into London Oaks, into London Oaks to give out freeze pops to some kids in the hot sun. Amen? Yeah. That's a weak amen for a church that's in the wild. We have to be engaged in our community. We have to be engaged in our neighborhood. We have to be a church in the wild. We have to go where the wild things are. And here's the deal. Bring the wild into the church. Our goal is not just to be the church in the wild, but that the wild would follow us back to Jesus. <laughs> follow us back to the cross. That doesn't necessarily happen overnight. Salvation's run isn't a sprint. It isn't a hundred meter. It's a marathon with hurdles. <laughs> People don't typically run marathons with hurdles. <laughs> it's a marathon with hurdles. So not, not now, not only do I have to continue to have the stamina to run the marathon, but I have to also have the pacing to jump the hurdles and not misstep. We are in a marathon with hurdles trying to win as many souls as we can because here is the truth. He's still coming. And I would hate for us to be so, uh, so self-absorbed that we're not feeling the people who need to be ready when Jesus comes. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, won't you make us a church that feels? Won't you uh, turn up the sensitivity of our lives and our ears that we can hear what it is that you're saying to us, the people who are screaming while their mouths are closed. God, I pray now in the name of Jesus that you would allow us to hear the trees that fall in the forest with no one around. I pray, God, that you would allow us to hear the silent cries of the mother who uh, is single and struggling to take care of her children who's not even saying anything. I pray that God, for some reason, supernatural naturally you will call us to ride through neighborhoods near us and communities near us just to pray for the people that are there I pray God that you would make us a beacon of light that is so bright that when people see us they just come up to us and say could you pray with me can you talk to me for a second can you be with me for a second I pray God that you would supernaturally bless every person every church in the room that we could have the resources to bless at any whim on any whim at any given moment the people who have a need I pray God that when people reach out to touch that we feel moreover God I pray God that we are so engaged in community and in your word and in your prayer God and accountable to you that when people reach there's something to pull from that there's power within us to pull from God in the name of Jesus we pray let the church say I agree I agree, I agree. amen church in a while church in the in the wild a church that feels somebody says I'm a church that feels oh uh, joining Radical City Church today, we are a church that is here to disrupt the culture, engage the community, and disciple the least, the lost, the last. We love you, and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. Now, Father, bless us, keep us, make your face shine upon us, be gracious unto us, and give us peace. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Why don't you have some high five somebody on your way out?